my name is Dr. Shanda Blackman, and I'm a cardiothoracic surgeon at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Today, our panel will be talking to you about the future of image-guided surgery and the era of 3D printing and holograms. The panelists will introduce themselves. Hi, my name is Todd Demme. I am the uh, Chief of Thoracic Oncology at the Can Rutgers Cancer Institute of New Jersey. I'm Mark Berry. I'm an Associate Professor at Stanford University. Uh, where I do general thoracic surgery. I'm David Cook. I'm the head of general thoracic surgery at the University of California, Davis. So we have a wonderful panel for you today to talk about what we think the future of visualized surgery will be. And I'd like to start the conversation with Dr. Demi, who gave a great talk yesterday in TechCon about the era of holograms and visual surgery, the Google glasses Dr. Cook was talking about, and Dr. Barry moderated all of these sessions. So. I think you know, you've done a lot of research with holograms and putting on optical devices and trying to incorporate what we're going to be doing with the visual field of surgery. So what do you think the future will hold? I think the future uh, of this augmented reality is going to be, at least in the short term, some sort of uh, display that's maybe worn on the head and uh, can, can basically convert the light that's in the room that you're looking through and then add to it with basically a holographic engine within the goggles and then lays that imaging information or the other information that you might be very useful to a surgeon on top of that to help, help improve the, um, the ability for us to conduct these operations. So I, I kind of imagine if you're coming down, uh, you're a pilot, you're landing a plane, you're coming down, you're driving down the strip or you're doing a vat slow back to me and you're dissecting the pulmonary vein it might show you the phrenic nerve and say, you know, this is a no-go zone, fly zone, no-fly zone, kind of the same thing that pilots have the augmented reality when they look at an image and they see this enhanced reality. Right, there's three companies, one that really have things that are actually out there now. One is um, uh, the, the Sony uh, Smart Glass, and then there's the Moverio, um, which is an Epson product. The Epson product actually has been now an FDA release where uh, the uh, individual who's maybe putting an IV in can put these goggles on and look at the patient's arm and it brings up all the veins, uh, basically takes the skin away and allows them to insert directly and see the venous anatomy. Uh, I think that's just basically a very small start to what this is really going to potentially become. So Mark, you're the robotic expert in the room. I think you've gotten some experience with augmented reality. Certainly the robotic platforms have that ability already. Yeah, there's a number of things that are available now, such as being able to get some idea of uh, the perfusion of organs when you're operating on them. Um, there's a technology there that will help you actually visualize something that may be deep in an organ that's not on the surface, but you can at least tell where it is. And these are the kind of things that can really help improve the efficiency of, of procedures uh, where you may be able to speed things up, you may, may be able to plan things better, you may be able to do things like, which you've done a little bit, print out a 3D vision of what it is you plan to do and be able to really plan that out perfectly from start to finish. You may be able to plan how long it's going to take because you know exactly what you need to do and it may just sort of enhance the, the patient care really from start to finish. Yeah, I think it's all about enhancing patient safety planning, being able to teach in a more efficient manner. I remember when I was a resident, we were getting ready to do a VATS lobectomy, or an open lobectomy back then, and you had to learn the anatomy on the fly during the case, and sometimes your vision wasn't quite great, and you'd have to go back to these black and white or color drawings, and now I'm so jealous, I wish I could have trained today, because our residents get 3D models to learn from. I think even having a hologram where they can rotate the image while the case is going on, to really see what's going on is really, I think that's what the future will be like. David, what do you think? I, I totally agree. I think, um, especially if you go back to something like Google Glass, an optical head-mounted display, uh, we've talked about the, the obvious value to patients, um, but you bring up the educational value for clinical education, not only for our trainees, but uh, things like maintenance and certification. Um, many uh, physicians have used Google Glass um, to do teleproctoring uh, in a simulated manner where you can operate um, and someone else, a th uh, another party uh, in a different location can observe your point of view uh, of your operation 
and then guide you through that operation and critique you through that operation as well. So they can telestrate on a monitor what they want you to head towards and you can see what they're telestrating because you're sharing the image. At least verbal cues, okay. um, but the technology allows the potential for telestration uh, as well. So I think we're going down the future, enhancing patient safety, making it easier for surgeons to see better. What do you guys think about 3D printing? Well, I, 3D printing is uh, also, uh, you know, very interesting. There's some new technology that is actually increasing uh, the speed of 3D printing, uh, uh, you know, hundred, uh, hundreds of, uh, high, making it hundred times faster uh, by a different way of, of basically allowing you to grow, kind of grow the crystals almost real, real time. And, um, and that's really going to potentially revolutionize uh, 3D printing to be able to make things actually right there in, the, in whatever application you're doing surgically and be able to either implant it. And, and these, uh, so really I think a lot of this technology is really going into the industry. It's going to come into, into the medical industry very soon. Right. I've used 3D printing to 3D print a prototype of something that I've invented and I've used it to create a model to innovate to do a completely VATS pancos tumor resection. So it's, it helps innovation during surgery because you can think outside the box without the patient sitting on the table and you can work with multiple specialty teams. So Mark, you're at Stanford. You're like the heart of innovation. Do you guys have a good experience with 3D printing? We currently have a limited experience with 3D printing. Um, we have radiologists that are interested in trying to do more for us. You know, some of their interests are in actually maybe doing 3D printing of the tumor itself within a lung, and then if you're planning on trying to do a sub-lobar resection, it will give you an idea how likely it is you know, you're going to get a negative margin or where you need to go to get a negative margin. Um, you know, I, I, it, as it gets easier to get a 3D model, you, know, you could envision a situation where you're planning a lobectomy on somebody and you just print out the lobe and then instead of just relying on you know I'll find the structures as I encounter them you can plan it from start to finish and not only for the surgeon but also for trainees you know to really have an idea you know this is exactly what we're going to do in this patient. Right last year at the STSU course we had a 3D printed cage that we used to put the heart lung block into to help enhance visual reality for the course. And I think a lot of our residents feel like that enhanced reality makes the simulation more real. I think they like that a lot. I think a lot of things too that will be used for is instead of using um, animal, animal organs to do practice surgery, we can actually print you know, lifelike versions of the human or organs. And also what I've used it for is to, to design a catheter. I actually, I actually was able to print in soft materials pulmonary artery casts so that I could uh, test the catheter design, actual physical replicas of what a human anatomy is rather than trying to test it in animals. Right. We have uh, Gustav Oderich from our uh, interventional vascular group who is now 3D printing the aorta and he practices complex deployment of aortic endografts, putting the, the uh, 3D printed aorta on pump, putting it on a real table under fluoroscopy and during the fluoroscopic procedure while it's being perfused, it looks exactly like it does on the fluoro table, and he can practice the cannulation technique, the angles, the deployment of the endograft, putting the side branches in, and then he does it on a real patient. So I think that type of enhanced reality, printing the, the anatomy and practicing without the animal organs, I mean, I think it's pretty hard to find a, 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 any kind of an animal model with an aortic uh, aneurysm. <laughs> I think there's certain specialties that amend themselves well to 3D printing. Um, and you brought this up, congenital heart surgery uh, with the vast uh, different anatomy of the heart. And in the past, uh, Shanna, you've brought up the idea of an open source database of 3D, 3D printable data where perhaps uh, as a library someone could print up a, a pre previously identified uh, congenital abnormality and then have that in front of them and be able to study that. Right, there's a new 3D printing journal and they're talking about exactly what Todd and I talked about maybe two or three years ago, which was Todd's idea of let's print, this, let's print in the journal the STL file so that people could pull it up or put the QR code so that somebody could link to the STL file. The real value and the uh, IP, I think, in these images 
is the hundreds of hours of work that go into sitting down with the radiologist and the surgeon and selecting what things need to be printed, what things don't need to be printed, creating that model. That model has value. And creation of that STL file, whether it becomes a hologram or it becomes a 3D printed model, is really a representation of someone's work. And it should have tremendous value. And you're right. I think creating a congenital heart uh, anatomy lab that someone could get for teaching would be tremendous value, even pulmonary or cardiac. I think it's great. It's a great way to learn. All right, any other comments? I think even right now, the, the Journal of Thoracic Cardiovascular Surgery, when I published the article I was referring to about the pulmonary arteries, they did allow us to put a link to an STL file that someone can download. So you can actually do it right now with, uh, you know, if you've done this more work, and most, most editors have a, you know, ability to link another type of uh, file, not just, a, not just a video file, but these files that we're talking about, STL files. Right. Well, I think the future looks quite good. We have a lot of things coming down the pipeline. If you have any questions, feel free to contact any of us. We're happy to talk to you about new technology, visualized surgery, 3D printing, holograms, Google Glass, whatever it is. We're excited about the new technology. Have a great day.